Boy, informative, entertaining, and protected the Second Amendment. Welcome back to Elster's Rifles and Reloading. In the review of the Palmetto State Armory 18 inch, one and seven twist, Cold Hammer Forge FN barreled upper in 556. And trust me, this video review series is going to be epic. Now in the beginning part of this series and probably the tail end of this, while we're not doing load development, which I'll probably end up using a high power scope for, but at least in the first initial shots to get this barrel broken marginally, test general function and get our fire form brass. And at the very tail end, I plan on using this PSA branded low variable scope, one to six power and it comes with a QD mount. I believe this is just a rebranded Lucid Optic, uh, but right now PSA is running not only this low variable scope, but the QD mount to boot together as a package shipped for $349.99 with a promo code, and it is a spectacular deal. Now, first and foremost, before I do anything in this video review series, I want to be clear and honest with you guys. Both the upper, the QD mount, and this low variable scope was sent to me from PSA for T&E purposes. So I just want to be upfront and honest with you guys. But I think this entire package in itself is going to be an amazing series, and I'm really looking forward to it especially when we do the low development with this 556 five, upper that has a one and seven twist that usually tend to favor heavier bullets. Heavier bullets just mean longer distances to shoot. Well, enough of the BS talk, let's jump right into this. We're gonna go over general overview of both of these. Quick touch base with some old reloads I have so we can get some fire form brass and let's head out to the range. Well, first and foremost, this upper doesn't come with a bolt nor a charging handle. And obviously it doesn't have a lower on it. So I'm going to have to take care of that issue. And I'm going to have to steal the lower off my PSA 6.5 Grendel firearm. And if you haven't seen the video review series that I literally just finished up with this, check out my playlist area. I have an insanely in-depth video review series on this particular firearm and it is insanely awesome and it's just as epic as this firearm review series is going to be. But what I'm going to do is rob the lower off this. Being that the 6.5 Grendel is an AR-15 platform, I could simply take the lower off that and use that with this particular upper. And it's really that awesome and easy. I could save a lot of money by not buying a completely different firearm. And this happens to be the PSA F Cancer Lower. And this lower means a lot to me. Obviously, you know, some of you guys know that I went through my own bout of cancer. I would say this lower is a tighter fit with this 6.5 Grendel upper. And it's still pretty tight with the 5.56. It's got a little bit of play, but not much. So enough of the BS talk. Let me take this lower off and we'll rob that and put it on this upper. Now the next thing I need to do is rob the carpenter nickel plated bolt, 5.56 bolt out of my 5.56 10 and a half inch AR pistol. And it seems like I got a bit of review series on damn near every PSA firearm. And I actually have an, an insanely in depth video review series, uh, not only this 556 five, 10 and a half inch AR, AR upper, but also the 7.62 by 39 AR upper. And that also has a nickel plated bolt in it. But I need to rob this bolt out of this particular firearm and also the charging handle. I mean, I suppose I could buy these parts separately, but they're interchangeable. So why the heck not? Now, some of you might be curious about this, but this upper with a no bolt carrier group and no charging handle is coming in at 
four pounds, 5.1 ounces. Now something I really like about this FN Cold Hammer Forge barrel, it's very similar to my Rock River Arms ATH barrel. And the fact that it has a heavy, damn near varmint bull barrel profile up to the gas block and then a medium contour in front of that. So it kind of knocks the weight off a little bit, but you get somewhat of a bull barrel accuracy out of this upper. And only time will tell if that is the case. So let's throw in this PSA nickel plated bolt. And this is a 556 PSA carpenter bolt. And with the bolt and the charging handle, looking at five pounds, 1.7 ounces. Now this F cancer lower of mine, which is freaking awesome and I love this thing. <laughs> I uh, put in a hyperfire competition trigger. So it's got a straight trigger on it with a finger pad. Uh, this actually is the Elander 6.5 Grendel mag. So I'll have to take that out and actually use a P mag. Uh, but it's hard to beat these hyperfire, especially this competition trigger. It is buttery smooth and the pull on this is so crisp. And I've tested this out and I actually have a video on this in the first part of that 6.5 Grendel review series. And two pounds, four ounces, which is pretty darn consistent for an average of two pounds, 3.8 ounces. And if, if you never dealt with a hyperfire trigger before, you can see it's got a double spring action in it. And it's interesting, you, you, you hit that crisp trigger and there's little spring force on it until about halfway through the stroke and then it comes home with force and it's hard to explain this in person unless you get behind a hyperfire trigger but these really are hard to beat now they don't exactly give these away i think they're roughly about 250 bucks but in my opinion they're worth every single penny now in regards to the buttstock, this has a carbine tube on it. So I went with the Luth MBA3 buttstock. You know, if you had something like a rifle length uh, tube on this or uh, buffer tube, I probably suggest getting, you know, the Luth MBA1, which is very similar to this, but for a rifle length or probably get a Magpul PRS. But for the money, these Luth MBA one and two or three, I think they come in different uh, flavors, depending on what you got. They really are hard to beat. So let's slap on this lower. And this is, in my opinion, gonna be somewhat of a DMR rig, designated marksman rifle. And let me show you the tolerance here. So I would say there's, a little bit of play, but not much. I say that's very typical and standard. It's not really wobbling too much. Um, but yeah, I would say it's very, very acceptable. You know, my 6.5 Grendel, that upper to lower fit is insanely tight. I mean, there's not an ounce of wobble in that thing, but this is definitely suitable. So let's do this on the scale. So looking at seven pounds, 13 ounces. Now as for the uh, custom series PSA, one to six by 24 scope, this is coming in at one pound, 11.8 ounces. And so far I'm pretty darn impressed with this thing, especially for what you can currently get it for, $349.99 with that promo code. You know, it's got a nice weight to it. It seems very heavy duty. And like I said, this is a, a rebranded Lucid optic. And in my opinion, they make pretty darn good optics. You know, it's the exact same thing. It just says PSA on it. Um, the only thing I don't really like about this scope are the caps. I just wish these caps fit a little bit more snug, especially this back one. It seems like this back one just, I don't know. It, I've already had it fall off a couple times, so I don't know. I might have to put a little bit of tape on the inside in there. It's a little trick if you want to get your caps a little bit more snug. Um, but it does come with these flip-up caps, so I'm really impressed with that. Um, obviously, it's got the adjustable diopter, so you can adjust your clarity on the reticle. Obviously one to six power. And I'll splice in a picture right now of the clarity of the glass, at least the best I can um, with a camera here. And this is a one X 
and I would say it's very, very close to a true 1X. I wouldn't say it's exactly 1X, but it's really, really close. And here's a picture of the 6X, so you can get a better idea on the high end of the magnification. And I really like that reticle, and it looks like it has somewhat of a bullet drop compensator system in there. That's really, really sharp. And I really like this throw lever that this also comes included. You know, you just screw this in. If you don't like it, you can screw this off. Um, as for the illumination, it seems pretty darn bright. Um, I'm pretty impressed with that also. And I'll also splice in another picture of that reticle with illumination. And what I really, really like about this particular scope is the fact that it has zero stops and they're easy to adjust and set your zero stop. And also the turrets are lockable. They don't spin in order to make an adjustment on your elevation or windage, you actually have to pull this out. It has a nice tension to it. And you have pretty, pretty good audible clicks. I'll see if I get this up to my lavalier here. So really audible clicks, I really like that. And the same for the windage. And in order to set your zero stop, it's really simple. Once you got your zero set on your elevation and windage, you just undo these little set screws here and pull that screw off. You pull the cap off and you turn this till it says zero on your elevation and zero on your windage. And you just put them back on and set those screws home. And then if you want to make an adjustment, like I said, this is a half minute of angle adjustments on the elevation and windage. You just pull this up and if you wanna, if you're shooting at 300 yards and you wanna make that elevation adjustment, you just make that adjustment, push it back down. And then when you're done, you just go back to your zero stop. And that's where this thing really shines. So I'm really impressed with this scope so far. Um, battery caps here and the QD mounts okay. I wouldn't say it's spectacular, but for what you're getting for 349 in regards to the mount and the optic, it's a pretty darn good deal. And it's obviously cantilever for an AR and it's at the correct height for the correct eye box for pretty much any AR setting. So, so far I'm really, really excited to use this and we're gonna take this out to the range, at least in the first part here, and I'll probably use it in the tail end of this part. I'm probably in a, gonna end up using the high power four to 16 vortex scope when I'm doing my load development. And it just makes sense to do that. But for the first part here, and once we get that load development done, we're gonna slap this scope back on because I really wanna use this as a designated marksman rifle. And you can see this back cap kind of coming off and I'm not a huge fan of the caps, but other than that, I think it's a really good setup. Now, in order to adjust these QD mounts, which is really nice, is you just pull these out and you push on this and you can see that that nut will pop out and then you can just make your fine adjustments if you want a tighter or more loose fit on these QD mounts and that's how you adjust it. It's really easy. About the only thing I notice on um, this QD mount, I kind of wish that these didn't go up and down like that. I wish they kind of snapped back straight. I suppose it's not a huge deal, uh, but you can kind of see that these kind of flare up and down. I kind of wish once these locked home, they just stayed straight. So that's, it's not, like I said, it's not a huge issue, uh, but that's something I did notice. And it seems like the quick release buttons here are pretty solid, but Overall, the fact that you can get this entire setup for roughly 350 bucks, it seems like a pretty darn good deal. So let me get this mounted on this entire firearm and just pop these out. And I have this pretty much pushed all the way forward. I like the back of my diopter to be in line with my charging handle. So in order to do that, pretty much got to push this thing damn near all the way forward. And you can see when I put this in, I like to push it forward and then lock these home. And it's a very tight fit. I'm really impressed with that. But in order to get this diopter in line, with the charging handle, I literally got to push this mount all the way forward. And I also have to push this uh, one to six power 
custom brand PSA scope damn near all the way forward on the mount too. So keep that in mind, but it's not a big issue, but you can see now it's in line with the charging handle, especially for charging it, makes it really easy. And that's just, for me personally, that's how I like to set up my ARs. So this current setup without a loaded magazine, we're looking at nine pounds, 8.9 ounces. Now I currently have the M-Lock bipod adapter on my 6.5 Grendel. I still have the last part of this series of shoots. So I need to keep this on. So when I go out today, I'm gonna to have to shoot this off a bag. But I wanna give you an idea of what this total weight would be with something like a Harris bipod and a P-Mag. So you're looking at, if I can do this without scratching this, <laughs> you're looking at 10 pounds, 10.4 ounces. Now this upper comes with the standard A2 bird cage brake. Not a big fan of these at all. I plan on swapping this out. I'm gonna try and get uh, a Gen 3 APA Little Bastard brake for this. But for right now, at least in this first part, this will have to do. Now I have some old reloads laying around that I actually use for my 10 and a half inch AR pistol that is in 5.56. And I also have some other reloads laying around that I use for the wild chamber in my 20 inch varmint bull barrel. So let's quick check those out and then we'll head out to the range. Curious to see how it prints right out of the gate. And this has a one and seven twist, especially at an 18 inch barrel, it's most likely gonna prefer a heavier bullet. Something like a 68 grain bow tail hollow point or something like this 75 grain bow tail hollow point. And typically what I usually load with my one and eight twist ARs is 60 and 55 grain VMAX. Now, with that being said, I'm gonna guess, being that this is an 18 inch long barrel with a one and seven twist, like I said, it's gonna prefer most likely a heavier bullet. I don't know that yet until I get rounds done too, but I don't have reloads done. And if you follow my reloading series, you know I'm huge about getting fire form brass and measuring that brass once it's ejected and bumping that brass three thousandths of an inch, at least for a semi-automatic. Now, I just happen to have this, these reloads laying around, and some of these are on their last leg, like this one here. It's on its fifth fire. I actually put on here trash brass trash brass after you say that five times fast but this is actually a 60 grain v max and this is actually set up for my rock river arms the 20 inch varmint bull barrel and the headspace is designed for that particular firearm it's got a headspace of four five two let's check out a couple other ones here four five two and it should work out of this fire, but I won't know until I shoot this out of that fire. I'm going to take one shot, pull one of these pieces out, and I'm literally going to take this to the range, and I'm going to measure that headspace and make sure that the headspace is sufficient. It's not too much, not too little in regards to this particular upper, this one right here. Also, I have some reloads here that are actually for my PSA 10 and a half inch AR pistol. And this has a little bit more bump on the headspace. Um, this has actually a much more generous headspace. These were 1.4. Where did I say these were? These were, let me just double check. So 452. And I think these are a little more generous. It's probably a little bit less than 452. Yep. So 1.5. Of course, I'm dropping ammo on the floor. Let me try another one here. Yeah. So a lot more generous headspace, 3 thousandths of an inch. So I could test both of these. If this doesn't have enough headspace, I could put these in there, a little bit more generous headspace. And I could fire form this out the range. At least get the barrel initially broke in. Grab those pieces of brass between both of these. Measure the headspace and see how that fire forms. I used to even have some of this. This is 60 grain VMAX. This is 60 grain VMAX. And these are actually 55 grain VMAX with XBR 8208. 
These are Varget and this is Varget powder. So this should be rather interesting. All right, let's get this. That looks good. This is what you call the caliper add-on accessory. <laughs> what I plan on doing here is starting out with one shot. I'm gonna actually look down this rifle's bore. I'm gonna marginally zero the scope, looking down the bore, and then going up to my scope and adjusting that. Taking that one shot, and I'm gonna collect that piece of brass, and I'm gonna measure the headspace on that brass before and after I take the shot. And I'm also going to marginally zero this in the boot, so I'm kind of killing two birds with one stone. So enough of the BS talk, let's get this going. So let's quick bore sight this firearm. And what you do is you just look down the bore, and I got my target set down there at 50 yards, and I'm going to take that really large diamond on that 50 yard target, and I'm going to center that in the bore. And you're going to notice as you look down the bore, obviously there's two circles, a bigger circle right in front of the chamber and a smaller circle down at the muzzle. You've got to center those two circles and then put the diamond obviously in the middle of that smaller circle. And I'm going to go up to my target and I need to go down and to the left considerably. And what's nice about this PSA 1-6 to six power SFP scope is it has zero stops on it. And I could pull this up, and I need to go down considerably. And I need to go to the left. So I'm gonna pull this out, adjust this to the left, go back down to the bore. And we just keep on adjusting this until you're on target. And that should be pretty much it. So let's put this firearm back together and take a shot and see how this bore sighting worked out for us. And that should be reasonably close. At least close enough so we're not wasting ammunition. All right, let me set up my range bag to catch my brass because I want to double check that headspace. So my headspace bump gauge here, and we'll go from there. All right, put that up so I'm not hunting down that piece of brass because that piece of brass is gold. Zero out my calipers. Now I'm gonna grab this brass with the 55 V Max, and this had some minimal headspace. Rather play it safe than sorry. And this has, let me show you the headspace here. This has a headspace of 1.450, it's more of a 223 headspace. Now remember, these bump gauges don't tell you the exact headspace. All these bump gauges do is tell you how much you bump the brass or how much the brass expands when you fire form it. And you can actually take your bump gauges out to the range like this. And I'm gonna show you how much this is gonna expand. So I'm gonna just load up this one round and take a shot. So remember, this is at 1.450. And we're gonna see how close this bore sighting is. And we're gonna kill two birds with one stone. All right. That didn't Locked back on the last round. That has me somewhat concerned there. But uh, let me grab this piece of brass. It very well could just be the magazine, but we're gonna see how much th this expanded. So you could see that it expanded almost five thousandths of an inch. So four thousandths of an inch. 
So when time comes to bump that brass, when I reload it, I'm gonna bump that back to 1.451, 3 thousandths of an inch, and it really is that easy. So let's head down and check out I'm gonna save this piece of brass. This piece of brass is gold. And let's head down and see how close my bore sighting was. Hey, look at that. That's not too darn bad for your first shot. Looks like the elevation's perfect. I just need to adjust that to the left a little bit. Not too bad. Let's take one more shot and see if we can get that bad boy right on the bullseye. Now that did not lock back in that first round, so that has me a little bit concerned. And I don't know, we're just testing, we're testing the function, see how everything works. All right, so I'm gonna grab one of the same thing, 55 grain VMAX. I think that's where this is. And we're gonna double check the headspace once again. Remember that other piece was so 1.450. And we're gonna double check this piece. So we've got it zeroed out. And this round has a headspace of pretty much the same thing, 1.450. So let's fire this, get this fire form, see if it comes to the exact same thing of roughly 454, 455. And I'm hoping to God that this locks back at this round. Let's see what happens. All right, and also I need to adjust the scope to the left. See if we can get on bullseye within two shots. All right, let's try that, see how that works. And that did not lock back again. So once again, that started out at 1.450. And exactly the same, fire formed at 4545. So you can tell, that's why you don't use a case gauge. You consistently bump your brass. I'm gonna save these two pieces of brass. I know that this is now fire forming at that. So I am not gonna shoot any more of that because it's not locking back. And I'm actually gonna grab one of these other ones that has Bargett in 60 grain VMAX. Now this has a little bit more HUD space and this should still work because it should be under 1.45, this is 1.452. Remember this is 60 grain VMAX with Varget. The other one was 55 grain with XBR8208. XBR so we're starting at 452. This should expand up to 454, roughly 455. And let's see if this locks back. And I got a feeling I'm gonna have to try a different magazine. I don't have another P mag with me. It's the only one I got. And I can see down range that that impacted a little left and two, a little left and high, about one inch left and one inch high. So let's take this one. Now this is a different bullet, different, totally different um, powder drop, Varget. So it's going to impact completely different compared to that 55 grain with XBR 8208. All right, so remember this piece was 1.452 and it should be at 1.454 and right there my friends 1.454 let's head down to our target at 50 yards and see what that looks like all right so not too darn bad so this was our first shot after I bore sighted, this was my second shot. So these are both 55 grain. This is the first shot adjusted. And these are both the same round. And then this is a 60 grain VMAX with a different powder. So it looks like I need to come down just a little bit, but not much. Not too shabby.
Well, I dug around my range bag and I don't have another P mag, damn it. I wish I did, but I don't. The only thing I had was a steel mag. So I'm gonna try this and see if that locks back. If it doesn't lock back on this, I'm gonna be somewhat concerned in regards to this gas block and the gas tube. It might not be getting enough gas, but who knows? Let's, try, let's test out the steel mag and we'll go from there. I am gonna run down to the 100 yard mark and set up a target. All right, so I got the steel mag out, so hopefully that works better. We'll see if that locks back. If it doesn't lock back on this steel mag, I'm gonna be somewhat concerned. Uh, but I got my calipers zeroed out here. So we zeroed out. And I got the fifth round here that I'm about to lock into that magazine. You can see I've measured all of them. They're 452. So all of these should expand to 454. So let me get this clipped in the magazine. So five total rounds. Now let's see if this locks back in this last round. Let's cross our fingers. And it did lock back. So it must be the magazine. So let's run down and see how we did. Hey, hey, that's not too darn shabby. That's pretty impressive for non-developed 60 grain VMAX. You know, I've haven't done any low development for this and that is probably sub MOA, if not right at an inch. I would, I'm thinking it's probably about seven eighths. If for first shots out of 60 grain VMAX, keep in mind, this is a one and seven twist barrel. And it's most likely gonna prefer a heavier bullet more than 60 grains. Now keep in mind, this PSA one to six power SFP, second focal plane, scope adjusts in half minute of angles or is this is your six covered would say eight sixteenths <laughs> i'm sure ray with x is gonna get a giggle out of that but anyway we need to adjust down i believe i said a half minute of angle so down one half minute and we need to adjust to the left almost one full minute. I would say actually more like three quarters minute of angle. And we need to adjust the left. So this only adjusts in half minutes of angle. I can't do three quarters. It's either gonna be half or one full minute. So I'm gonna actually just do a half minute. So we're gonna adjust like that. That's it, I can lock these down. All right, using the steel mag, I'm gonna keep an eye on that last round bolt hold on the fifth shot. Hopefully it locks back. Then we'll know for sure it's the magazine. And we made the adjustment on the scope. So we are 100 yards, let's see how this works. Now this is a six power scope. I cannot see my impacts, but you guys can, because obviously I got a camera down there. All right, and she locked back. Now, I know barrel breaking is a hotly debated topic in our community, and I used to do it when I first got my firearms, you know, shoot it once, clean it once, shoot it once, clean it once, blah, blah, blah. Um, I just don't do it anymore. I, I just stopped doing it. Never really seen a difference if I did it or not, but there's one thing I will do is when I first get a firearm, I'll definitely rigorously clean the bore, especially the chamber, make sure there's no filings in that bore or the chamber. And then after a few shots, I will definitely clean it once again out of the range before I take any more shots. Like I said, you, you've seen me take 10 shots so far, so I'm just gonna quick run this down the bore about three times. And this rifling is breaking in and it's gonna take probably a solid 50 to 100 rounds and every bore is completely different. You just won't know until you shoot the firearm. They're like fingerprints. Like, it's just like every human's different, every bore is different. And sometimes they shoot amazing out of the gate. You don't have to do anything. They just shoot great. And I think that's where this one is heading right now, especially with that first group, man, with non-developed loads. And 
think these first two groups are hovering right, right around a minute of angle, if I combine them both. We grab a couple of these pieces here, and we're just gonna quick check out this brass. So I'm checking out the primers. The primers look really good. Absolutely no cratering on that primer. I'm checking for ejection marks. That looks great. The case mouth opening is round as can be. And usually I will put a little bit of Velcro on that brass deflector, which I've yet to do, but it looks like I don't even need to do it. Man, everything is looking really, really good. Especially now with this two, this new magazine. Now keep in mind, this is with a six power scope, non-developed ammunition or reloads. And I am gonna guarantee money once I throw a 16X scope on this thing for low development purposes, it gets a reloads. This thing is really gonna shine. So we got our four remaining rounds that I have last left of this particular ammunition. All right, four rounds, bolt locked back. Everything's looking good so far. Got this on safety. Let's go down and see how it did. All right, so I would say that group is about the same as the other one. And like I said, uh, I think just this barrel needs some time to break in. Now I'd say that's very normal. Uh, I'd say that is, well, an inch and a quarter, maybe inch and a half. I won't know better until I can score this up. But I think for non-developed rounds, just keep in mind these are 60 grain out of a one and seven twist, which are gonna prefer a heavier bullet, something like a 68 or 75 grain. And these are non-developed with a six X scope. This isn't a high, really high power scope. There's a low variable scope. Once I get a 60 net scope on this, we do some low development with something like a 68, 75 grain boat tail hollow point. I feel very confident these are going to shrink even more. Well, I would say that was pretty darn impressive for the first trip to the range with a PSA 18 inch coal hammer forge upper with an FM barrel. You know, this first five shot group is a little under one minute of angle. I'm gonna say it's probably in the 0.9 minute of angle if you have to measure this. Uh, and these other groups are hovering right around one and a half minutes of angle. You know, this trip really for me wasn't about testing the accuracy. Obviously I'm shooting lighter bullets than this barrel probably prefers to shoot being that it has a one and seven twist. You know, we didn't go over 60 grains on any of those bullets. And it's most likely, I'm gonna guess, and you don't really know, truly know until you get those pills down that rifle bore, but it's most likely gonna wanna shoot something like a 68 or even heavier, 75 grain bolt tail hollow point. But like I said, we're not gonna know until we shoot this, but for the first initial five shot group being sub on away right out of the box, that's pretty darn impressive. Now, I definitely learned a few things on this trip and number one would be i'm throwing this p mag <laughs> in the trash uh i gotta be careful with this though i mean obviously it did lock back on the steel mag that i have here and thank god i had that in my range bag and if i didn't have that it would have kind of been sol other than locking back and it did lock back with a steel mag, but I definitely want to test this again when I go back out the range with a P-Mag because I don't particularly like these steel mags. I did notice though on that slow motion video footage, when I got done shooting it, I could check it out on my phone and I could zoom in on my phone a little bit, that I did notice some gas leaking out of the gas block.
I'm not sure where I'm going to check that footage out again once I get it on my big screen TV on the, my computer. But if I get a PMAG in here, I'm going to test several PMAGs, maybe take two or three PMAGs with me, make sure that all three work. Different generations too. Uh, make sure it locks back and then I'm good to go. And I'm also checking out that ejection pattern on that slow motion footage. And it seems like it, it is shooting more towards two o'clock and then it kind of shifts a little. That leaves me to believe that this is over gas and it's just a PMAG issue, but I won't know for sure until I can test it. But that's something I'm definitely gonna check out. Um, but other than that, the function seems to be pretty good other than that mag issue. Let's hope the guy is just a crappy PMAG. <laughs> um, now, with that said, if you are new to my channel, new to my videos, I did a live event, I think two videos before this one. You gotta check out that video playlist area. I have a video in there that was live and I prepped some brass for this particular firearm. Being it's a NATO chamber and I have several firearms that have NATO chambers and a 5.56. They usually fire form about 1.457. And we bumped that brass back in that live event. If you did watch this, this is the brass. And we bumped that brass, bat. We bumped that brass, <laughs> God, five times fast. Bump that brass, bump that brass, bump that brass, yeah, whatever. Anyways, we bumped that brass back to 1.453. And it's once fired Lake City brass. It wasn't shot out of any of my firearms. It was purchased once fired Lake City brass, most likely from a military purchase, large barrels or bins. But anyways, we did bump this bat, brass back to 1.453. Well, as you've seen out the range, and I'll clip that video footage in right here, you witnessed it yourself, that re those reloads that I had laying around, that's not low developed for this particular firearm, Started out with a headspace of roughly 1.451, I think, was some of the 55 grain, if I remember correctly. And then the 60 grain had a headspace of 1.452. Well, the problem with that, and that's why I use bump gauges, not case gauges, is this particular chamber on this PSA 5.56 18 inch Cold Hammer Forge FM barrel is fire forming at 1.45. Four. So that means I'm only getting one thousandths of an inch headspace clearance, which is more bolt action headspace clearance. It's, in my opinion, you should have a minimum of three thousandths of an inch. I typically bump my fire form headspace from semi-automatics ejected three thousandths to five thousandths of an inch. And that is not enough. So what I'm going to have to do is throw this back in the wash, get that old lube off, Redry it in the Lyman Cyclone case dryer, re lube it back up and run it back through my sizer and jump, uh, bump that headspace back another two thousandths of an inch. So I got a solid three thousandths of an inch from fire form, as in this picture and out in the range that you witness at 1.454. I'm going to have to bump that brass back to 1.451. And that happens to be the exact same, exact same headspace bump that my PSA 556 AR pistol fire forms at exactly the same to the T. And I bumped that headspace back to 1.451. And like I show you out at the range, and that brass started out at 1.451 and expanded to 1.454. So 3,000 of an inch expansion. And as it sits right now, I'm gonna to have to do some more resizing. You're probably gonna see that in the next reloading series for this firearm. And what's gonna be special about that is I'm gonna do that reloading series, not like in the 6.5 Grendel where I edited it and all and made it really fancy. I'm gonna do the reloading series for this live. And I know some of you guys really enjoy that because you can ask those questions. So the next part of this series, will be me, well, you won't see me wash this and put it through the Lyman case dryer, 
that's kind of boring. But I'll at least get it washed, cleaned, and we're going to resize it again and bump it another two thousandths of an inch. So if you're watching that series, you better make sure you hit that notification bell so you don't miss it. Really, you should just hit the notification bell anyways. But anyway, I think this is a good start. And I'm really excited about this. And this shows some very, very good promise for initial shots. And the C seven one eight groups right out of the gate with a 60 grain bullet when this is most likely going to prefer something like a heavier 68 or 75 grain boat tail hollow point like i said we're not going to know until we just test it and do low development but so far it's really promising well i hope you guys enjoyed the first part of this series and i'm super excited and so should you and some more additions i'm going to try and make to this is obviously get some other pee bags but i want to try and get another APA little bastard break, another Gen 3, but for this particular firearm, being that the threading is different on this comparison to my 6.5 Grendel. So stay tuned to the next part and it's gonna be live. So don't miss it. If you guys enjoy this content, you, you enjoy my videos, you feel like you learned something, scratch my back and I'll continue to scratch your back with this content. Hopefully you guys have learned from by not only likes, like, subscribe, share, all that good stuff, but become a Patreon. It helps more than you know. Make sure you hit that notification bell and I'll see you guys in the next live video.